Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Even Heroes Die devlog. 2022 has been a busy year. There have been a lot of exciting developments, the first of which is that Even Heroes Die now has an official Steam page. There's a link in the description, so please take a moment to check it out and wishlist the game. Now you may be thinking, why do I need to wishlist this game? It's not even out yet, the page looks like garbage. But guys, this is the number one thing that you can do to support the project. It'll help me out immensely, so please do check that out. And if you don't, I will put NFTs in this game. So Steam is cool and all, but the real reason I'm here today is to talk about boss fights. Specifically, we'll be looking at a brand new boss fight that I've just implemented, as well as my creative process for doing so. We'll also be examining boss fights from Hollow Knight and trying to understand what makes a boss fight engaging. So whether you have a passing interest in game design, or you just want to know what makes a boss fight tick, or you'd like to gain some insight on how to design a boss of your own, this devlog will have something for you. I've dabbled in game design and messed around with Game Maker for, well, over a decade at this point. And one thing that I've always shied away from, even as I've honed my skills over the years, is boss fights. They just look so intimidating. And as an avid gamer myself, I know what it feels like to face off against a disappointing, or even worse, a broken boss. There are just so many things that can go wrong. Some games feel like they have bosses just for the sake of having them and beating them is mostly just a matter of going through the motions. Other games have bosses that are nigh impossible if you don't come with the right builds or the right equipment. One all too common trope is for a boss to be invincible for most of the fight, until a moment arises in which a weak point is exposed. These kinds of fights usually amount to a lot of dodging and waiting, which can grow tiresome. I don't necessarily think that there's one best way to design a boss fight. It all comes down to what kind of experience you're trying to create. That being said, I have noticed a pattern in the types of encounters that I enjoy the most. Hollow Knight is often praised as one of the quintessential indie metroidvanias, and I think one of the best aspects of the game is its fast-paced and free-flowing boss fights. Being that Hollow Knight is one of my primary inspirations for the game's combat, I decided to take a closer look at some of the game's battles. The main reason why I enjoy Hollow Knight's boss battles is that you're able to damage them at just about any time. The enemy is just as vulnerable as you are, making it feel as though you're on a more even playing field. You aren't forced to wait around for a glowing red spot to appear. Instead, you'll need to pay close attention to the boss's patterns to find the best time to strike. Ultimately, you may still end up playing a bit of a waiting game by trying to bait out that one attack that gives you the best window for a counter strike, but it's a much more engaging form of waiting. You can play as safely or as aggressively as you want, and it's up to you to find that balance. Get too greedy with your attacks and you'll be swiftly punished. This risk and reward, counterattack based battle system is also what the Souls games are built upon. Perhaps the most notable exception in Hollow Knight is Umu, in which you have to wait around for Quirrell to attack before you can deal damage. It's a jarring contrast to the game's other bosses, and while it's nice to see Quirrell in action, Umu is one of my least favorite bosses because of it. Since Even Heroes Die's true ending will require you to beat every boss in a single run, players will likely face off against these bosses multiple times. Therefore, to keep things from getting stale, I realized it would be important to give players a similar sense of freedom during these encounters. So this has all been really insightful so far. To recap, for Even Heroes Die, we want our bosses to always be vulnerable and be like Hollow Knight. Okay, well that's cool and all, but how? I mean, have you looked at these things? This looks pretty intimidating to make. It turns out that these bosses aren't actually as complicated as they look. And the process for designing a boss isn't all that different from the process of learning to defeat one. Either way, you need to break down and understand the boss's moveset. Let's look at a fairly simple one, the Mantis Lord's fight. The first phase is easy enough, you fight against one of the lords while the other two just kind of watch. Only after you murder their friend did the two remaining lords enter the fray at the same time. The battle can seem frantic with many things happening at once, but if you pay close attention, the pattern is actually quite simple. Any action that a Mantis Lord takes can be broken down into three simple steps. Appear, perform an attack, and then disappear. This remains true even when two of them are attacking you. There's nothing coordinated about their attacks, aside from the intervals at which they appear and disappear. Next, let's drill down into the attacking phase a bit more. What kinds of attacks can the enemy perform? Well, they can appear from above and slash down at you. They can appear at your side and slash horizontally at you or they can appear clinging to a wall and throw boomerangs at you. That's all there is. So to program a boss like this, all you would need to be able to do is create a horizontal attack, a vertical attack, and a projectile attack, as well as some teleporting to glue everything together. 
If you had programmed even a couple basic enemies at this point, creating a moveset like this isn't a big stretch. Now that's not to say that Hollow Knight is any less of a masterpiece, but demystifying these impressive boss battles was an important step for me in understanding how to craft one myself, as well as just finding the motivation to finally try my hand at it. So for the boss of the forest dungeon, I decided we'd be going up against a dark mage-like character. Since he's a mage, it would make sense for him to teleport around and cast spells at you. So I decided that his attacks would follow a simple loop, the same one used by the Mantis Lords, as well as several other Hollow Knight bosses. Teleport in, attack, teleport out. So that's the first thing that I coded. For the attack phase, I started by just making him do nothing for a few seconds. We can fill that part in later. He would appear in a random spot, wait for a few moments, and then disappear. Oh, and I stuck to placeholder sprites in the beginning. No point in wasting my time drawing animations that I might end up deciding to scrap shortly after. Whenever the boss would teleport away, I'd have him choose what his next attack would be. Depending on his choice, he would teleport into the proper position and then perform the attack. Each of these would end with the boss teleporting away, so the cycle could begin anew. With that basic outline done, I started to fill in the blanks by designing a few attacks. The first one is a homing energy projectile. He'll teleport in and fire a blast at you, which will follow you until you can lead it into a wall. For his next move, he'll appear above you and rain energy blasts down upon you. These won't follow you, but they'll lock onto your position just before firing, so you'll need to keep moving to dodge them. He can also use his magic to summon all kinds of thorns. Sometimes he'll have them quickly jut out from the floor, and you'll have to get yourself into position to dodge them. Other times he'll create them along the wall, and he'll use wind magic to try and push you into them. You can use your sword at just the right time to clear the thorns out of your way, but if you brought special equipment to the battle, like the iron element or some spiky cleats, you can resist these blasts of wind to get a few free attacks in. He'll also summon these spiky thorn balls that can get in your way. You can slash them to get rid of them, or if you wait too long, they'll burst into a ring of spikes that you have to dodge. Lastly, sometimes he'll go in for a plain old melee attack by teleporting low to the ground and then flailing his arms at you like a madman. I definitely took some inspiration from Xan for this one. While it was important for my boss to have a diverse set of attacks, I also wanted the battle to grow more frantic as you came closer to victory. There's nothing like that feeling of excitement when you get a Souls-like boss down to half his health, only to have your dreams crushed when he suddenly gets twice as aggressive. To support this, I made sure to design my boss so that every bit of behavior was a variable that could be tweaked. This means the duration of every pause between his attacks, the number of projectiles he'll fire at you, the speed at which he moves, even the time it takes for him to teleport away between attacks can all be changed mid-battle. Before each attack, the boss will check what phase he's in and reset all of his variables accordingly. The result is a fight that feels more alive. His patterns are fairly easy to pick up on and counter during the first phase, but before you can get too cocky, his attacks will pick up. For fellow game designers, I need to stress that the most important part of this process was to break the boss's actions down into smaller components that could be designed separately from one another. Bosses are complicated, and designing one can be a daunting task, so you need to be able to focus on the individual pieces without keeping every aspect of the battle in your working memory. If done correctly, you should be able to create a flowchart of the different states your boss can be in, as well as how they transition from one to another. This is called a state machine. I first figured out that my boss would teleport in, attack, and then teleport out, solving the problem of how his different moves would chain together. This is the primary loop of the battle. From there, I could add as many different attack options as I wanted, without having to do anything to change that primary loop. It was essential that each of these attacks could be designed separately, with no assumptions being made about any other moves that the boss might have. This is what we in the programming world refer to as loose coupling. So the next time I'm playing Elden Ring, or I'm in the shower, or I'm playing Elden Ring in the shower, and I find random inspiration for a new move for my boss, it's a simple matter of plugging in the coordinates to teleport to, as well as the code for the actual move. Nothing else needs to change. If you're trying to implement your own boss or enemies, I highly recommend reading up about state machines. It should give you enough of a technical perspective to implement everything I just talked about. And that's all I really have to say about the game's new boss right now. Just gotta go back and repeat the process a few more times. There's still a lot more for me to show you guys, but judging by my script, this is already a pretty long video. Thank you very much for watching. Please like if you enjoyed this video or learned something new, and subscribe to stay up to date with the project. We also have a Discord server where you can provide suggestions and feedback, as well as see the latest updates for the game before they hit YouTube or Twitter. And if you do nothing else, ignoring all of those other things, please wishlist the game on Steam. It's just about the number one thing you can do for the project, aside from 
maybe buying it once it's actually out. So please do that. Check it out. Thanks everyone. Until next time.